you. Uh, up next, we're going to start letting the uh, lightning people, lightning talk folks in. These next talks are going to be very fast paced. Um, they're each each speaker has um, five minutes uh, to present, um, and once I'll be timing them, and if they go over their five minutes. You're going to see me come back on camera and say thank you, and we'll move it to the next one. It's supposed to be all good fun and, and everything. So up first, let me let Arne in the room here. Arne, if you want to share your slides and get ready, I will start the timer once I say go. So. And I'll, I'll give you time to get your get your slides up and then I'm going to mute my camera and start the timer. Okay, hi. Can you see my screen? Um, can I can. Me? I can see it. There's a little artifact left over from something, but unless you meant to have a black block, rectangular block on your... Oh, okay. Gotcha. Oh, Thanks. there we go. Okay, um, so my name's Anna. Um, I want to talk about Seek and a bit of JavaScript. Uh, I would like to mention that that is half Seth Hall's fault. Um, so lightning talk, I'm going to jump into a demo now. Uh, so this is a few terminal windows and I'm running a 4.1.1 build and it has a plugin installed that is called Seek.js and um, that is basically embedding the Node.js JavaScript or the, yeah. JavaScript into Seek, and I have a bit of a setup. So I have a pickup here, and I have a local Seek file, which basically just disables logging. Uh, if I run this, there's nothing that happens. Um, I can create a JavaScript file, and then just do console.log hello Seek. And if I run this, um, it and pass it in the command line, um, it should print hello sick. So if, you, if you're a bit used to JavaScript, there's event handling and one event would be, or, and also seek, and one would be sort of HTTP request where you pass in a function, connection um, method. I think this is sort of the arguments that we got. And then I can do console log. Um, and I can also reference with the, the original host from the connection object. Okay, so if I run this, that should come out on the console. Uh, so yeah, so it's that got, got for that URI from uh, that host and that's in the PK file. So the other event that exists through the log stream is this HTTP, log HTTP, which basically is called when the, um, at the same time when the, 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 the log entry is actually created and this is just getting a record. Um, so there's in JavaScript JSON string file, I could do rec uh, print print the stringified version or the, the JSON file version or the JSON converted version as a string uh, via console.doc. So if I run this, uh, I get the whole um, log record as JSON formatted on the console. Um, so I'm not sure how many minutes I have left, but this is JavaScript, so you can do. You can use the party libraries like Redis and create a client. And then doing the, the log event handling, could say client.publish. And I want to publish into the HTTP topic uh, that JSON string that we just outputted. So if I run this, it hopefully doesn't crash. Yeah, so it doesn't, uh, it says I can't find the module Redis. Can npm install Redis? Uh, 
Um, and after that, it runs the NFL run properly, where it's clean and subscribe to the SGP topic and run this again. Uh, we should see the, yeah, so we see that the Redis server just received a HTTP lock uh, as in JSON format. So basically we, we have a sort of JavaScript based HTTP lock exported to Redis uh, written in that one script. Okay, so yeah, I'm, I think I have, uh, I think I'm done. Uh, I have a bit more, but there's I'll you have 35 more seconds if you want to keep talking. Um, yeah, so the, the, the other example I had would be running an HTTP server, which is easy to create with JavaScript. And then you can, um, yeah, no, I don't have the time. Uh, you can expose some information of seek via an HTTP endpoint. Uh, okay. That. I'll show that slide. So this is very experimental. And maybe next week week as a seek week next year, we can talk a bit more about this, depending on where it's going. Um, yeah, that's it. I think this quick lightning talk would be a great webinar at some point, Arn. So if you're up for a webinar and people want to hear more about this, please message Arn in the channel and let me know so I can get Seth to work on him about giving an actual, uh, you know, lengthier uh, webinar. Arn, thank you so much for your lightning talk. Up next, we have Mateus Valentine. Some of you in the community are familiar with Mateus. He's a longtime community uh, member. And Matthias, I'm letting you in now. Matthias, if you want to unmute and share your slides. There you go. Sounds good. And when I say go, I'm going to mute my camera and my microphone, and then I'll start my timer. So give me just a second. Ready. Let's see. All right. The floor is yours. Hi there, everybody. I'm going to talk to you with you about how to become a logger node, how to consume Zeek logs natively. natively. Uh, I'm Matthias. I was Vern's uh, first PhD student. So yeah, I have a long history with the Zeek team. I'm excited to show you um, what we're doing today. So Zeek in a single mode uh, set up produces logs, writes them to disk. You can do the same thing in the cluster where you have multiple workers. They send by default all their log events to the manager and then uh, the manager will write uh, the logs. And if the manager is just busy writing logs, you will um, have the opportunity to create a dedicated logger node that sends, uh, that does just that, receives all the events from the workers and writes them to logs. So what happens underneath here uh, on the inside in the logger node? If we decompose the Zeek node, um, we have in the bottom, we have the C++ core and, and the top, the, Zeek, uh, the script land, which uh, from where you can basically control the logging framework, manage the streams, manage the filters and write data into it. And for that, you use the built-in functions um, they will actually call into the logging manager. The logging manager itself uh, has a bit split internally um, the, the writing process into a front end that still uses the Zeek vals. And then uh, there's one thread per writer backend. And these are basically uh, plugins. If you are running in, in a remote environment, you, you actually, as a logger node, you get the events from somewhere, from the workers. And uh, they come into the broker manager and the broker manager unpacks them and then uh, forwards them to the logging manager. The, the different backends in the logger are uh, yeah, plugins. For example, you can write ASCII logs or you can use existing um, plugins uh, for example, Apache, right then to Apache Kafka. Um, so in this setup, there's a few 
points uh, of overhead. On the one hand, so when we receive the data um, via CAF, so broker is the messaging library of Zeek, there you uh, have one set level of serialization. Uh, and then actually from there, uh, you have to go into threading valves, again, in the broker manager. And uh, then the data gets passed around from the writer in the message to the uh, writer back end. And there's a two specific transformation taking place there. And then sometimes at that point, you also have to, again, uh, re-serialize in case you're sending out uh, over a socket or uh, write to, to disk. Um, but all the data is already here. So maybe we can all bypass this and take the events and just directly feed them to where we want them to have to be them. Um, that's, that's something we were trying um, and experimenting with to see whether that's feasible. And so we basically replaced the logger node with a VAST instance. VAST is a high volume telemetry database and it provides a search functionality, um, execution of security content, it's a seek native. So we were, we were looking to see, is this working? Um, the nice, uh, a nice side effect is that we don't need any Zeek plugins. It runs with stock Zeek. It runs, it runs with Zeeks that we are not, that man not managed by us. Um, it's one node less, and we have a back channel via broker to the workers. So let's try this and see how far we get. Um, yes, the communication is broker. So what do we have to do? Let's reverse engineer the protocol a little bit. It's very simple. So first, all we have to do is subscribe via broker to the topic Zeek logs. And then a Zeek node will send us a log create message and then a bunch of log writes that actually contain the payload. So log create is uh, the first message. That one has a bunch of stream data into it, of metadata followed by all the different field types, names, for example, TS, UID, ID or H, and so forth. One field um, at a time listed. This is all broker data. We can readily parse it with the broker library, no problem. But then the log write message, it's a bit of a mess. Uh, it's just binary data from mess from the perspective of the consumer because it's opaque, cannot do much with it. So then the question is, okay, is it how, how much effort is it to, to go in there and see if we can unpack it still and, and get what we want? So inside, the broker manager that I showed earlier in the bottom left, uh, yeah, there's, uh, we see that it's basically Zeke's binary internally serialization format, and we are um, deserializing here a bunch of threading valves. Um, from there, yeah, we tried to rebuild this, was not that hard. Um, we basically replaced that logic, uh, and then we tried, tried it out. Does it work? Can we actually fully get this? Uh, and replace it, yeah, it works. If we have a plugin now in VAST, all you have to do is VAST import broker and you're done. And in Zeek, all you have to do is uh, either be in a cluster mode already or you just listen uh, via broker and that's it. So thanks for, thanks for listening. Uh, yeah, join our community. Um, we are building open source tech, VAST and Threadbus. Um, we'd love to hear, have you on our Slack. Um, we do a lot of Zeke stuff too. Thank you. Matthias, thank you so much. Up next, we have Seth Hall. All right, Seth, if you want to share your screen. Are you using slides for your lightning talk? I am. Right. Are we live? Are we live right now? We are live right now. Okay. So I've got five minutes starting 30 now. seconds ago. Starting now. Okay. All right. So, uh, okay. I'm talking about telemetry and Zeek. Uh, this is not, I, I was watching some of the other presentations and it's maybe not as technical or even as demo-y as some of the other ones. I'm going to say primarily what this talk is, is it's a, uh, uh, just talking about, oop, it's oops, my bad. That's basically what it is. Um, there's, <laughs> I, I don't know who loads this. I, I think it's like misc slash stats. If you load that, you get a stats log. You get stats updates, I think every 15 minutes by default. Um, I made that this log a number of years ago, and uh, 
it's sort of <laughs> my bad. Um, it's not good. What do you do with it? Like no, no metric systems or telemetry systems are based around this idea of, oh, you receive an update every 15 minutes. And not only that, but I believe if I remember correctly, it's, it's differences. So it'll be like in the last 15 minutes, Zeke saw X number of, package, uh, of packets. In the last 15 minutes, Zeke saw something else. It's not great. Um, it just kind of, it, it also does give you a global view. So if you want to say like, oh, well, I want to see how many, you know, packets there were, or I want to see how many events were generated or something like that, you can't do it. So let's ask the question, how many packets has Zeke seen? How do you do that? I wish this was live because I would just ask like, like in person, because I would just ask the question, how do you do that? I mean, that's a really important question that really you want to feed into uh, Prometheus or some time series database or something like that. How many packets has Zeke seen? We, maybe we have dimensions there and uh, dimensions or labels, depending on which system you're using. They're basically all the same thing. It's, uh, you know, labels on it where you might have like broken out by worker. Or you might have it broken out by some, some other dimension or, or label. So I'm going to say that, you know, we can't really concretely answer that because the stats log doesn't do a good job answering it at all. Um, Another one, how many connections is Zeke monitoring right this second? So this is not a counter that goes up forever, like number of you know, packets seen. That's a counter that goes up until you shut Zeke down and then it resets. This is a gauge. It's going to go up and down. How many TCP connections are there, which is like it's a, a dimension of the data you, or like how many UDP connections is Zeke looking at right this second? Um, again, <laughs> You can't answer that in, in Zeek with the current infrastructure without building out something of your own. Uh, and then we can go a little deeper and ask something like how many DFA states has Zeek created? And if you don't know what it is, what that means, don't even worry about it. But this was a really important metric at one point in the past. We, we had a tremendously bad uh, performance regression years ago because Zeek was creating a huge number of DFA states we had no visibility into it. And uh, we, we had to do something hacky. So these sort of telemetry questions always end up coming down to something hacky. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that again. Uh, whatever that is, Picard, Cyan. <laughs> um, and so the conclusion that I, I believe is that we don't exactly have an answer yet. We've made a little bit of an, uh, uh, we've, not a little bit, we, we've started to put some code in place around Telemetry. And when I say we, I'm, I'm being very generous to myself. I've done almost nothing in Zeek with this. This has really been Dominic, um, whose last name I'm blanking on for some reason at the moment, but Dominic has really been building this out. And there is in Zeek 4.0 and 4.1, 4.1, there is a telemetry framework starting to show up, but it's, I, I think it's still a little primordial and it's going to need some more time before we figure out what exactly this means. But the result of the, the conclusion of this talk is sort of embarrassment, sadness, just dope in general. Um, and we want to fix that, or I want to fix that. And I, I believe everybody else wants to also, because we really should be making those questions uh, have good answers. And we, uh, we, we should present them in ways that fit into existing and in, uh, modern telemetry systems. And we should be doing all of that and we need to, because you can't, uh, if you can't measure something, you can't use it effectively. And so we need to be able to measure stuff. Amber, I think I'm done. <laughs> you have 10 more seconds, what? <laughs> 10 seconds, I, can't, I got this to 10 seconds. Yes, you did, like, I'm impressed, you know. So cool. And next, <laughs> Justin, following you though. So let's uh, let's let Justin in. And Seth, thank you so much for playing along with our lightning talks. Thanks, Amber. All right, Justin, if you want to share your screen, we'll test your sound right quick. Okay, helps to not be muted. I want to share just one window, this window and, here. And can you turn your sound up just a little bit? I can try to talk louder. 
That works. That's perfect. That works. I actually don't know where the button is, so I will just talk louder. Thank you so much. All right. And you can start now. Okay. So first of all, I don't think I remember where I saw the profiling information, but I'm going to talk a bit about how I improved the software framework performance uh, kind of across the board. So if you don't know, the software framework is this feature in Zeek that there's a bunch of scripts just like this one that when it detects something, like in this case, a user isn't header, it calls software found, and it will do this every time. And you might ask yourself, what is software found? So software found is this function that this is what the old version looked like. And this is some initial filtering. And what it does is if we didn't know the exact version, but we had an unparsed version, we will call parse. And parse does a ton of magic. And this, if I search for it, oops, I don't know what that was. If we search for parse, there is this script uh, that tries to look at all the different nonsense variations of user agents and figure out what actual software corresponded to some user agent. And it's kind of a set of complicated splitting and user agents, so not the fastest thing in the world. Um, but in Zeek, there's often two ways to speed something up. You can make it go faster, or you can try to call it less. So, well, first we could do a quick little benchmark and figure out just how slow or fast this might be. So here's a little script that just calls software parse a lot. We can call it 200,000 times and just get a feel for, for a particular worker, how many times per second could you even call this function? And as you can see, it is not very fast at all. It takes quite some time. We only get about, on this computer, tens of thousands of calls per second. And where we've seen this a couple of times is networks that either see like east-west API traffic or maybe someone doing a load test where Zeke just gets blasted with tens of thousands of the same kind of user agent per second. It ends up spending all of its time calling this parse function. So the way uh, we made it faster, the way I made it faster uh, in the first place was using this very simple uh, pattern in Zeek where we make a cache, which is just a table of the input string and the output value. And we simply say, if our string is in this table, we return the output value that we previously worked out. Otherwise, we go through the usual process of parsing and returning that value. And if we see how many times we can call that function per second, actually I have to add a lot more because it's actually quite a bit faster, which makes sense because instead of calling that function and doing all the regexes, it's simply just doing a uh, table lookup. So we can do a table lookup 300,000 times a second. Um, so that was kind of step one to speeding up the performance. Uh, the other thing, if you look at what this does, after it goes through the effort of calling parse, the only thing it actually does on a cluster is it sends it over to the proxy for aggregation. And the proxy is what deals with writing out the unique values into the software log. Well, if we're immediately going to send it to the proxy after parsing, what if we just didn't parse it, send it to the proxy and let the proxy do the parsing? So that was the other change, which you can see here, we no longer call parse. We just send the record as is over to the proxy. We did change the event slightly to use software new. And if I can find software new is up here. So you see, as soon as the proxy gets it, it has that same code just moved to a different node in the cluster. Uh, but the other benefit of doing it this way is because you might have say a hundred workers and five proxies, instead of all a hundred workers having to process the same data and then send to the proxies, you can do the caching on the proxies, which you only have to do once instead of you know once for each worker. Um, the other benefit of this is I believe this cache ends up actually being free because what the software framework eventually does, if I can find it, there is this tracked table that already stores all the software seen on a particular uh, address. So we are not actually increasing the amount of data that Zeek is storing in memory. Uh, we also, I settled in just kind of a, 
uh, feel that we should use a 65 second timer for this. If, if we're not seeing a particular user agent more than once a minute, it's probably not worth caching. But I didn't want to use exactly 60 seconds because you run the risk of you might see a user agent exactly every 60 seconds and you might end up expiring it even though you didn't need to. Uh, so yeah, that's just how one little part of Zeek got made slightly faster in, I think it'll be in 4.2, I believe, something like that. So we just continue to find little pieces like this that are just not as efficient as they can be and making them more efficient. So now if someone hits your network with a load test and causes say 50,000 HTTP requests a second, all with the same user agent, the load on the worker and on the cluster will be a fraction of what it was before. All right, and that's all I had. Justin, thank you so much. As always, your, your talks are already always informative and fun. So we appreciate you playing along with our lightning talks. And if folks, you would like to see more on this subject or you'd like to hear more from Justin, please let me know in the channel for this particular talk. I believe it is talk 10. So then I can go and ask Justin if he'll do this again for us. Up next, we have uh, yes. Johanna Johnson. Let me admit her. Justin. All right, Johanna, if you want to um, bring up your slides, that'll be great. And for all those speakers who um, have spoke on day three, uh, if you're watching, if you could go ahead and rejoin the Zoom because we do have a uh, speaker panel after um, Johanna's talk and we'll, I'll let you all in. And then we will take questions from the community. So if you've got some questions geared up or, you know, sort of, um, queued up for uh, the speakers for today, please uh, let me know or post them into the, the talk um, 11 track. Otherwise, the speakers for today get to hear my questions. And I think sometimes they don't like my questions. So um, we'll go from there. All right, Johanna, if you want to share your screen. And if you want to test your sound while your slides are coming up. while we're waiting on that. We do have some exciting announcements at the uh, end of today. Uh, we do have the winners from the, uh, uh, the CTF uh, that we'd like to announce and things like that. So please stick around uh, for, for our wrap up. It's only 10 minutes after our Q&A session. Johanna, I see that you're sharing your screen. I don't know if you're ready to unmute so we can test your sound. Um, how's my sound doing? Good now. Um, it just says now that your your screen sharing has started. Um, but I do you have slides? Or are you just sharing screens or because I don't see your slides? I only see where it says that you have started sharing your screen. Um, so, um, in theory, I'm sharing my slides. Uh, in practice, it looks like Zoom is not sharing my slides. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> it, it would seem that way. Um, give me a second. Uh, I'm going to try and get around Zoom being stupid. Um, <laughs> the other joyous thing about lightning talks and live presentations, you get to hear all the mumbling. Um, behind the scenes, which can often be called. And it's still, I don't think, sharing 
Well, would you be able to um, just talk about what it is without sharing slides? Could you do that or? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't, okay. I, I, under, I don't know why Zoom is having <clears throat> challenges. Um, um, it's some, some Zoom, Chrome, whatever. Yeah. That is that is quite all right. We can, uh, you know, we, we can make it work. So with that, I'm going to go off camera and I'm going to mute. You go ahead and present for five minutes. And when I come back on, you'll know that you're five yeah, minutes. I will on. make one last attempt. <laughs> we can roll with this. We're all agile. There you go. All right. All right. <laughs> there you, go. you got five minutes. Go ahead. and. Let's go. Uh, so I'm um, gonna talk about, uh, so I'm a principal engineer at Corelight. Um, I'm not on the open source team, unlike most of you we've been hearing. Uh, so I'm kind of uh, helping hit the rubber hit the road with uh, Zeek. So more of an operator than a member of the open source team. And uh, I did wanna to talk to you today about uh, <clears throat> policy hooks, because <laughs> it's very niche, it's very, uh, but it's still like, at the end of the day, it's uh, how Zeke emits things. So, uh, quick refresher. Um, so a stream um, in Zeek logging is um, generally um, like HTTP, SSH, one of those, it's, it, it's something Zeke is trying to emit. Um, it's uh, kind of a, it's a stream from a given protocol or something else. A filter on the other hand is, well, a little misnamed. Um, filters generally uh, actually mean, uh, they, 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 they take a feed from a stream and then they put it out to disk or put it out to someone else like Kafka or something. Um, so filters are not, they're, they are where emitting happens. And then, and then writers are something that is kind of part of a filter, but fundamentally they're one-to-one -one coupled and the filters are the things that do it. And then finally, and this is gonna be very important for what we discuss in a second, um, is hooks. Hooks are a Zeek script construct that are tied to the name. And anytime you hook that name, uh, you get called whenever that hook is invoked. Um, and if you reassign a hook, um, you basically uh, decouple all of the previous hooks. And that's gonna be important in a second. So what, what changed in 4.0, what changed in 4.1? Um, main thing is the, the predicate field on filters. So a function that's called right before you log, um, it has gone away. Um, in 4.0, you could still use it. In 4.1, it's gone. Um, it has been replaced though with uh, the uh, the uh, log filters. <laughs> so, or sorry, the uh, log hooks. So, um, and then the other one that came in in four one and only in four one is uh, a global hook for uh, log stream policy. So you can actually hook everything that gets logged as opposed to just one particular thing. So handling a predicate on a filter getting deprecated, um, you can do the same thing you did before. Um, it's, it's really easy. Uh, as you can see with the code changes, super easy. You can just in, instantiate a new log policy and assume it's gonna be the only one that's called even though it's a hook um, and just, that it's a very straightforward change, but they're gonna have some problems uh, going forward because um, if you ever operate in a Zeek environment where you have more than one person uh, involved, uh, yeah. So main things, uh, generally uh, assigning a new hook name to the log policy hook is gonna blow everything away that existed before. Um, so don't do that, please. Um, it's gonna cause a lot of confusion and frustration for all of us. I think.
Did I just break uh, my sharing? I don't think so. It looks like you're still sharing. Okay, cool. I can see your Slack channel. That, that is the problem. Um, that oh. is, and the uh, slides went onto the other desktop. One sec. There you go. We've got about 30 seconds left. And yeah, I should go. Um, sorry. Uh, so don't do any of these things that I'm talking about here. Um, log policy is just well, definitely, uh, it's tricky. Um, you can shoot yourself in the foot in about 12 different ways. Um, and uh, yeah, um, but there's the new global hook in 4.1. And the global hook uh, actually helps you avoid all of the problems you're going to run into, um, because you can do it on a per log basis. So you're not going to like run into this weird thing where like if you assign a log to a filter, uh, or sorry, uh, assign a hook to a filter, um, it it breaks everything, um, and kind of overrides all of the the previous uh, stream logs. And uh, yeah, sorry. No worries, stick around. You're part of the speaker panel. So just hang out in the uh, in the, the Zoom. Don't go anywhere. Uh, we'll, we'll admit other speakers. And if you want to stop sharing your screen, um, we'll, we'll head right into the Q&A 